celebration and information. I am so honored to have been chosen to speak today. I am Baba the Storyteller, also your resident griot. I travel all over the world teaching history, sharing music, culture, tradition. And this is especially important today to me because you see, this holiday is near and dear to my family's heart. Now, what's unique about me playing the instrument that you're seeing, the choral, ancient harp of the West African griots and speaking the language and singing in the music of the ancient Bambara societies. What's important about that is, well, you see, I wasn't born in Africa. No, I was born here. But when I was growing up as a little boy, I spent a lot of time with my great grandfather. And my great grandpa lived to be over one 110 years old. Yes, 110. Now, my great grandfather used to talk to me a lot about his mother and father. He loved them so much. Both his mother and father, or my great great grandmother and great great grandfather, were both born into slavery. So I am a descendant of those people who at one time in this country had been enslaved. Now, when I was growing up, my grandpa used to talk to me about the history and the culture. Juneteenth is just a small part of that history, and that's what we're going to share today with you, a little history of the Juneteenth. But not the kind of stuff you can look up on the internet, no. The kind of stuff that you hear sitting at the knees of your elders and the oral traditions and stories that were passed down when I was living in Texas, where I was born. So I'm going to finish this song, and then we'll start talking and sharing information on Juneteenth on a personal level. Na li lu li la, wo li ye wa la le. Fi na lu li la, wo li ye wa i po. Ja lo din din go wo li la, wo li ye wa la pa pa fe. Ye pa pa o, ini wo lu ra ja li a la, man di si la la mi ma ya. Thank you, one and all. That song, that is a very ancient song out of West Africa. It's called Sakadugu. It's a, it honors the history of those who have fought and died for their people, which is very appropriate for what I want to talk about today, Juneteenth. Now, having been born in Texas, you might think I have a very special connection to Juneteenth, and well, you wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> You would not be wrong. I grew up, there were two ways of uh, learning. One, we learned in our communities, among our elders and among our family, our history, our culture, our traditions. And then there was something that was different that was taught in the public schools that we went to. So when I was growing up, I had a very conflicted, very conflicted learning environment. In one way, it was affirmed, and in another, not quite so affirmed. But the history of Juneteenth, I started learning, well, when I was much older, a teenager. Uh, at the time when I was very young, the only thing I knew about Juneteenth was that, well, I got to eat a lot of red velvet cake and drink cream red soda. That's all I knew about, okay? <laughs> but I'm gonna share a little bit about that with you. But here's what I wanna do today. Most of what you can learn about Juneteenth, you can look up. But I wanna share something unique and something a little different. 
You see, one of the pieces missing from Juneteenth, which was established in 1865. Now, the story that you will hear is that uh, Major General Granger had come into Galveston and announced to the slaves that they were all free. And this is a little bit of the mythology that they had not heard that they were free under the Emancipation Proclamation for over two years. <sighs> Let me clear that up for you a little bit. Now, during that time, in 1863, and this was when everything changed, everything changed when the United States was fighting the Confederacy, they began to enlist what they called colored men, were African American or black men into service. Now, the, they called them the United States Colored Troops, USCT, USCT. Now, what had happened during that time, once they began enlisting these men to fight, is people began to escape their uh, slave labor camps, or what you might call plantations, and they would escape to the Union soldiers. And they would be recruited, and they would come back and fight. Now, that's one part of it. The other part that's so important about Juneteenth that I want to make sure we hold on to is that it was about a unification or reunifying of families. That was the most important part of Juneteenth. Because you see, Texas at that time was one of the last holdouts, <laughs> one of the last holdouts. And slavery had extended, the institution had extended that far. And there were people stop, trying to stop it from extending that far. But there was the breakup of families. And if you look at Galveston, that on the coast there, that little island, if you look at that little coast, look it up. You'll notice something. It's not too far from Louisiana. No, it's not. Now, we look at the borders of Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi and, Alabama and, and Georgia. We look at those borders today. And I know in our minds, we think that people don't cross those areas much. But they do. In fact, a lot of my family is also in Louisiana. A lot of my family is also in Mississippi. A lot of my family is also in Alabama. I just happen to have had the fortunate of being born in Texas. So my idea was of Juneteenth was gathering together. And what I used to hear the old people argue about, <laughs> and yes, they argued a lot, but what I used to hear them argue about was the meaning behind Juneteenth. Some people used to say it was when Granger freed the slaves. And then my uncles, who were much younger, would say, Granger didn't free anybody. The colored troops, they were the ones who freed. So I would listen to these arguments. Oh, and I would, well, I would enjoy hearing them argue. And there was one regiment in particular. It was the 25th Regiment, United States Colored Troops who had arrived days before Granger. And they, they, were this, they were some of the same troops that had liberated Appomattox. And they had come in and began liberating parts of Texas. They started in Brownsville. They were actually in Brownsville, Texas in like 1863. And they had worked their way through Texas. And OK, this just came to me. I have to share this. I'm treating you guys like your family, and you're sitting with me in a Juneteenth celebration. This just came to me. One of my elder great uncles, he used to love to tell us about, I'm trying to remember his name, Governor, I think it was Murrah. Yeah, there was a Governor Murrah at the time in uh, Texas. And <laughs> my great uncle used to say, you know, they had enslaved all of these people and they had treated them in horrific ways, horrible ways, dehumanizing ways. And many of these men, they went and they joined the Union, and they came back with rifles. And when Murrah and the, the white folks in Texas saw them coming, <laughs> well, I can't tell you everything my great uncle said, but there were articles of clothing left behind that should not have been left behind. And Murrah fled. Murrah fled to Mexico, where I think he actually died. Uh, you can look this stuff up. But I used to love to hear my uncles talk about how brave these soldiers were and how much they fought and how they put themselves on the line for freedom. For freedom. So it's a little disappointing to me sometimes when I hear that 
the narrative that, well, the enslaved people, they didn't know anything, and they waited for some good white person to come to tell them they were free. It's not the way it happened, people. Any human being on this earth desires their freedom, labors for their freedom, fights for their freedom. And to profess a narrative that takes the agency away from any people is wrong. Remember, there's another aspect to this. There was a great, one of the greatest thinkers, I think, in our history was a man named W.B. Du Bois. And he wrote about an aspect of Juneteenth that many people hadn't considered. He talked about, he called them slave labor camps. We, and he said that the enslaved people fought in another way. Work slowdowns, work stoppages, feigning illnesses, so that the production, the production that the South needed, that the Confederacy needed, it could not keep up because slave people were rebelling against that. And I guess, well, I guess the point I really want to make is that I want a more humanistic look and view at Juneteenth, the kind that I grew up with, the kind where I learned about the agency of black people during that time and the men and women who were fighting back. That's what I want to share more than anything. But I also don't want to forget the red velvet cake and the red cream soda. Because those are my memories. As a child, those are my greatest memories. Now, I learned something when I left this country and I went to Africa. I learned a lot about rituals and ceremonies. And Galveston was a major uh, slave port at one point. Well, was, they had also had a lot of pirates going in there, but that's a whole other story. Now, this port bought human beings from the west coast of Africa, from Nigeria, uh, from uh, Cameroon from different areas. And one of the things I learned in traveling throughout Africa is how sacred the color red is. I'm going to give you another perspective. Just hear me out. Let me give you another perspective. In many cultures, red represents many different things. Um, for example, among Bamana and West Africa, it represents nobility. Uh, in some other cultures, it represents sacrifice. And when the enslaved people came here, they weren't allowed to maintain their own religions. So what they did was they took the religion of the religions of the oppressors and they shaped them to fit their needs at the time. For example, in South America, they have what's called condomble, which is where they took the saints of the Christians and they turned them into what we call Orishas. In Uruguay, they have this thing called condombe, where they took the saints of the Catholics and they turned those also into Orishas. It was the same here. And this is why the color red is so important, because many of those enslaved were forced to adopt the religion of Christianity. But they shaped it so that their cultures could survive. And that color red, yeah, that color red, it signifies more than just red velvet cake <laughs> and red juice. It signifies sacrifice. It signifies the blood of the people, those people who I was telling you who fought. It signifies so much. And the next time you're celebrating Juneteenth and you're thinking about that, and you're gathered with a whole bunch of people, think about the color red as a form, well, of communion. Yes. I'm so happy and honored to have been able to share this few minutes with you. And I wish I could go on for hours more because there's so much more I want to share. But I'm going to close out with a song. And I just want you to remember, when you examine the celebrations of other cultures, when you examine the different ethnicities that live within this great country we call America, give them agency. Think about every human being's desire for freedom and all of our struggles and our fights for freedom. For me, that's what Juneteenth is really about. So let me finish this song, and then 
I want to thank you for having been here. It has been incredible. And I hope you got something out of this. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing this time with you. So the song I'm playing now, well, it's an ancient oral historian song called Lambango, Lambango. Thank you all. Ambia sinana, ambia sinana, ambia sinana, kumbemba jeli moza ninja lekele. Ambia sinana, bula bula julula, ibula bula kora jaluma. Ambia sinana, kumbemba jeli moza ninja lekele. Ambia sinana.